This morning our service is centered around our partaking communion. And in many churches around the world, I should say in all Christian churches around the world, there is some remembrance, some, some tradition surrounding communion. For most Baptists, we do it poorly. There are reasons. But for other churches, they might take it every Sunday. In some, such as the Catholics, they take it every time there's any service at all, whether that's on a Tuesday or a Thursday. And in some circles, uh, Christians will at home partake of communion themselves as part of their daily devotions. But the binding thread between all of us is that we all carve out time to remember the Lord and remember his words before his betrayal and crucifixion. But though every church carves out time, and though every church and every Christian who truly follows the Gospels makes communion a part of their, their discipleship and worship, oftentimes it is that regularity that can take away the meaning of the tradition. This morning, if you will, either look on the screen or turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians. I want you to hear the loving rebuke of the, of the Apostle Paul as he deals with the church who had forgotten why communion was important to begin with. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. Now, in giving you these instructions, I do not praise you. Since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must be also factions among you, that those of you who are approved may be recognized. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. Paul here is writing to a church that he helped to found in the bustling and economically diverse city of Corinth in Greece. They were a city that at the time when he found them was steeped in paganism. Great sin occurred. This, this place. So great that in both of the letters that Paul writes to them, he is continually battling things that other churches have overcome. He even goes in, in the second Corinthians so far as to say that he wished to give them the deeper things, the meat of faith, but that like babes they were still stuck on the simplistic things like milk. And here is one of the most simplistic things of all that they could not even keep communion without trouble. And you may say, well, what were they doing in particular? Very different than how we celebrate communion here and how most churches celebrate communion. They would celebrate communion every time they gathered together for a common dinner. It was a practice. Most churches were held in people's homes, and they were almost always and exclusively the most well-to-do of the people who could host the church for they had the largest space. So they would put out a buffet, they would put out the bread, and they would put out meat, and they would put out wine, and whether you were rich or you were poor, everyone was invited to eat together just as Jesus ate with his disciples. And while they ate bread and they ate meat, they would pray for one another, they would share the scriptures, they would talk about when Jesus was gonna come again. And as part of that dinner, they would take the bread and they would break it. They would take the cup and they would pass it. And they would, in the middle of eating, remember the promise of God. And this is how communion was done, but that was when it was done orderly. Here in Corinth, the rich who didn't have to work, they'd start the dinner at 4 o'clock. Never mind that the, the average workers and the poor and the slaves were still toiling until sunset. And by the time the rest of the church members would come, those who were able to come at the 4 o'clock call had already drunk all the wine and eaten all the bread, and they had left very little for anyone else, and they were drunk. And so then you have the poor who counted on this common meal, probably as their only meal for the day, 
who now leave hungry. Now we might say, well, you know, at church it's not our responsibility to feed it. All we're doing is coming for communion. Surely they had enough for that. But for the church in Corinth, this occasion was worship. Eating together, sharing one another's burdens in the most basic way of sharing food was a way that they shared the gospel. And so Paul gets wind. He's not in Corinth, he's on his travels. He's missionizing other parts of the Roman Empire when he hears what they have done. And so he writes a letter and he says, Shall I praise you? No, I can't praise you for this thing. In fact, shame on you all for your actions. So after Paul lovingly rebukes them, he's, and then now that he has their attention, he says, now listen, verse 23, Don, if you will. For I receive from the Lord which, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take this as my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Now what Paul says here is very similar. It's, it's a little bit simplified, but it is very similar to the words of the Lord Jesus himself in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where it's recounted, the Lord's Supper. But Paul wasn't one of the disciples. Paul didn't get to see it firsthand. He didn't talk to Luke and he didn't talk to Mark and he didn't talk to Matthew to get their accounts before they wrote it down. When he penned this letter, there were no Gospels that he could refer to. So for him to have this phrasing, either Paul has made it up or the Lord has given it to him directly. And this is what Paul says. Paul says, do you remember that time when I persecuted the church and God met me on the road and changed me? And do you remember how for three years I spent in the wilderness learning from the Lord Jesus himself? This is where this comes from. My personal walk with God and his revelation to me. And if God thought it was so important that Jesus would tell me his own words, then communion is important enough to take seriously. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread or drinks of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let each of them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This is a, a passage of scripture I hear quoted often when communion is upon us. And in most instances, it's done by well-meaning pastors and well-meaning deacons who want the people to, to repent and come to the altar in a worthy manner. But it's taken oftentimes out of context. And oftentimes it's misunderstood by the very people to whom it's preached. I know of numbers of people who have told me that they can't take communion. I have a, a friend of mine, a Christian woman, who in the 15 years I have known her will not take communion because she was taught as a child that if you are not perfect before God, it's unworthy to take of the blood and the bread. That's not what Paul says here. Paul says that if you sin this morning, you can't take of the bread. Paul doesn't say that if there is a tinge of disappointment or doubt in your heart that you can't come to this table. What Paul says is if you have forgotten why the table exists, then sit down. If you are coming like the Corinthians to the church because there's a buffet, then you're not doing it right. The way that we reap this judgment that he speaks of, the way that we take light of the body and the blood is by doing just that, taking light of the body and the blood. Communion is not a tradition. Communion is not just a filler in a service to make up an hour. Communion is not just something that we do because our parents did it and our grandparents did it. It's not just something that makes us feel good. It's not something to give the, the pastor a break from preaching so long. 
communion is an act of worship. But it's only worship if it's done with the right intention. The right intention is that we remember the body that was broken for us. And we remember the blood that was spilled for us. And we give thanks for it. Those of us who are in this place who can truly say that we are grateful for the Lord Jesus who hung on the cross, then regardless of whether or not we made a mistake this morning, we got angry on the way to church. Or if we had impure thoughts the day before. Or whether or not we have messed up and we feel like our lives are, are unredeemable before God. It doesn't matter if that's the attitude we come with and the sin that we bring into this church. But if we will but focus on the, the Christ on the cross, the death he paid and the blood he spilled for our sins, then we walk to this table in a worthy manner. Not because of our own righteousness, but because of his. And this is the point that Paul wanted to make to his, his disciples at Corinth. That it's not, the problem is not that you all are, are sinful and dirty and unclean and unworthy. But the problem is that you're not taking communion as worship. It's an activity. And if you treat it as an activity, then stop. If you will turn with me, just a few books before or look on the screen. In preparation for communion this morning and to help all of us. To approach this with the solemnity that is necessary for it to be worshipped, I thought it important for us to hear the gospel to remind us of what Jesus walked through. This is Luke chapter 23. At this point, Jesus has already been through hell on this earth. After he shared communion with his disciples, they left. Judas went to betray him. And the disciples went to the garden to pray where Jesus struggled with the decision to submit to God's will. So much so that the capillaries in his face burst and he sweat drops of blood. This is after he's arrested in the garden and betrayed by Judas's kiss. This is after he's taken to the public trial of the Sanhedrin where he is smacked and beaten and had false witnesses come and lie about his words. This is after he is dragged to Pilate, where first it seems as if Pilate might have leniency, but then pressured by the crowd, Pilate turns and has Jesus scourged, whipped 39 times, leaving his back exposed with hardly any skin left over its muscle. This is after Herod has mocked Jesus when Pilate sent him to him. This is after the people who Jesus had just healed, whom he had just spoken to days before, taught and delivered, rise up and cry, crucify him, and give us the murderer Barabbas instead. This is just after Pilate has stood and he has washed his hands and tried to abscond himself of the responsibility. This is after the soldiers have forced a crown of thorns upon his head tearing into his flesh, mocking him, beating him, spitting upon him, dressing him in robes on his already seething flesh. All of this has already occurred, and yet this is just the, the foretaste of his suffering for us. And all of this is part of Jesus when he said, this is my body, take and eat. Verse 26, now as they led him away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon the Syrian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross that he might bear it after Jesus. And a great multitude of people followed him, and the women mourned and lamented. Skip to verse 32. There were also two criminals that were led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place of Calvary, there they crucified him, the criminals, one on the right, one on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And the soldiers, they, guard, they divided his garments and they cast lots. And the people who stood by looking on, but even the rulers who were with them sneered and they said, He saved others. Let him now save himself if he is the Christ, 
chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him coming and offering him the sour wine, saying, If you are king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. <coughs> then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do, not, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, assuredly, today you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all of the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having this, said this, he breathed his last. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly, this is a righteous man. When we come to this table in just a few minutes, we come not as a tradition, not as an activity, but as worship. We take up this bread because Jesus commanded us that as long as this church is on this earth, we are to take communion. We are to remember his body broken for us in all of the many ways. From the beatings, to the crown, to the nails in his hand, to the spear that was even thrust in his side after his breath left him. In every way we are to remember his sacrifice of his body. And more than that, we are also to take of the cup and to give thanks for the blood that was spilled for us. Because Jesus told us on that night as he stood with his disciples and they ate, that no longer would we have to rely on the sacrificial system of a lamb. Because God had now perfected and perfected through the Lamb of God. Once under sacrifice, we would have to wait. Now, unlike the disciples who took that meal in utter confusion as to what Jesus was saying, we have the witness of Scripture and we have the witness of 2,000 years of church testimony to tell us that Jesus is alive. It did not end with him on the cross. It did not end with him in a grave. It has yet to even end. For when Jesus rose from the dead, he gave each of us a promise that though we take communion now, there will be a day when he returns and no longer will we remember and focus on and worship through, through the remembrance of death. But we will celebrate with him at the marriage supper of the Lamb. No longer do we take the bread in that glorious day. Now we eat and dine at his table. Until that day comes, until the trumpets sound and the heavens open and Christ returns for his church though, it is an act of solemn worship for each of us to bow our heads as we contemplate the Lord Jesus hanging on a cross. The Lord Jesus bleeding from almost every inch of his body. The Lord Jesus unable to breathe. The Lord Jesus in insufferable pain for us. And then to take the cup and to rejoice that by his willingness to obey the Father and suffer, you and I have fellowship with God and the promise that one day when he returns, we all will join him in life everlasting. If you can come to this table this morning and take the bread and drink of the cup and remember and give thanks and worship him for those things, then you've done it in a worthy manner. If you can't, because you have heard the stories but you've yet to be able to trust in your heart, then ask the Lord, through the power of His Holy Spirit, to give you that faith today. Because to come to this table as a tradition makes you unworthy of the act. But to come to this table in humility and graciousness makes you all the worthy. And it is the purpose for which Jesus came, to redeem each of us by the power of His blood and through the sacrifice of his body.